Uh, we have Luke here to talk about uh, the GRU in keeping with the Russian theme that we seem to have going after the break. So give it Luke awesome. a hand and uh, take it away. Awesome. Good, yeah, so as I said, we're going to continue dunking on Russia for a while. Um, so am I. I'm a principal analyst at uh, Mannion Cyber Espionage Team. Um, since the invasion, I've been focused mainly on Russia um, for obvious reasons. So yeah, I'm going to start. I think, I think some other threat intel talks have been the same. Attribution is not easy. Um, we're fortunate today I'm not going to talk too much about attribution. Um, but I did want to say, like, what we've witnessed in Ukraine is a lot of different teams, different parts of the GIU working together. Um, so some of this, you may look and go, oh, that team doesn't sound like GIU, if you know much about the threat intel. Um, and that's because we're, we're kind of, like, badging them all. Like, it's not all just sandworm. It's a bit of everyone. Um, but, yeah, it's technical talk, so it's easy for me. Um, if any of you do have questions about attribution, um, you can give me a shout later and we can discuss it. Okay, so what on earth is disruptive tooling? So I like to think of disruptive tooling as kind of a sledgehammer. Um, there's one reason for it, and it's to break stuff. Um, and that's like the opposite to traditional kind of cyber espionage, right? Traditionally, you want to lie in a network, collecting intelligence for as long as possible. Um, but like a scalpel, right? You're just there for one or two things. Um, and you're going to get going. Um, so kind of how, how does Russia use kind of this sledgehammer? We've seen main, uh, three main kind of areas. So uh, distributed denial of service attacks, um, kind of endpoint or server denial of services. We kind of refer to that as wiping, and we'll discuss that a bit. Um, disruption to NG and communication sectors, kind of the big scary stuff. But it's interesting, like, GIU used to have kind of one or two big toolkits. Um, and we're seeing these days is they've kind of gone away with that. Um, we're seeing a lot more kind of low equity and kind of throwaway tools. So stuff written to do one thing and one thing only. And like very big contrast to like Indestroyer from 2016, which had like multiple um, modules to attack different ICS systems. Um, in the version we saw last year of Industry, it kind of had one, right? So Russia as a whole is kind of moving away from, from kind of one big toolkit to do everything, um, which makes our life a bit more fun and interesting. I just want to remember, throughout the war, um, GRU is working at pretty high pressure and a very high-risk environment, right? Um, probably one of the, the highest pressure environments for cyber espionage actors, um, a literal war zone. Um, and because of this high pressure and the high risk, they have to get stuff done. Um, we see they do a lot of kind of simple and stupid mistakes. Um, and like, as a cyber operator, they probably don't want to do that. Um, so they try to limit some stuff. Um, and one of the ways they do so, and it's something we see other uh, Russian-backed actors doing, is using a variety of coding languages. So rather than just writing um, your wipers, all your wipers in C, we've seen them try throwing in some Golang, try some .NET. Um, it's not always stuck, but that kind of makes our job a bit more uh, tricky because static rules don't really work. Um, as I mentioned just now, like limiting the lifetime, lifespan of tools, they're, they're using like throwaway tools, right? Um, they're designed to be used once or twice um, with some exceptions, and then never to be seen again. Um, and again, kind of part of that low equity, they're written to do one job. They're no longer kind of burning years worth of effort. Like from the industry days, that would have taken years to develop, years to design. Um, but instead, something that you can probably write in a couple of weeks, months, burn it, it doesn't really matter. Um, but one thing we have noticed, right, like each of these tools take time to write, to design, to develop. Um, and they're, they're starting to poach parts from other kind of either historic stuff 
um, or just from each other, um, which may and did um, come to burn them a bit. So like, there's, there's a pro of writing these low, lightweight tools. Um, the con is you, you are still developing quite a bit. And naturally, your developers are just going to copy and paste stuff, because developers are lazy. It's just life. So we'll jump into the technical bits. Um, I'm going to start with how do they kind of maintain access, um, mostly in some of their kind of longer running operations. Um, and one of the tools we found was a tool called Freeto. Um, a lot of our tools have tow or tank related stuff for obvious reasons. But there's Freeto, which is a lightweight shell code loader. Um, and as I mentioned, it's in, it was used in environments where they had prolonged access. Um, in some cases, like 10 months of access, right? Um, as, as with all nation state amazing tools, uh, persisted by a scheduled task, right? So, but then context, it's, like, it's not really that smart, but hey. Um, and he was responsible for loading one uh, downloader that we call Toastrap that I'll discuss in a second. But Frito did have some cool um, techniques. One of them was this anti-analysis feature, anti-sandbox feature, um, where effectively they took the command line argument, the first character of the command line argument, and, and then added it to a static value i. And if everything goes well, when you write that into memory, um, you should get a return. And therefore, your payload can continue running. You will run your toaster payload. Um, if you don't, you're going to end up crashing the process. And from kind of, if you are analyzing thousands of samples just through sandboxes, you're going to get away with it. Um, I'm also going to caveat here. Like those who know, Z is now a symbol of the war. Um, this was 10 months before. So yeah, w whether it was or not, we don't know. But um, it was 10 months, so don't, don't dig into it too much. But Frito was kind of a, a pretty interesting design. Nothing really smart, but um, the payload kind of allocated this read write execute memory and just copied a bit of itself into that region. Um, decoded that with literally decrementing it um, by minus one. Um, and then right at the bottom, it actually executes it. So pretty, pretty basic loader. Um, what was interesting, though, and we'll come back to this in a second, is this virtual alloc call. Because they're allocating uh, read, write, execute memory and doing absolutely nothing with it. Which you might think, that's, that's a bit strange, a couple of waste cycles. Um, but yeah, we, we'll, we'll come back to this. Now, let's move on to Toastrap. So Toastrap was uh, the shellcode downloader that they run. Um, and it's likely a copy of uh, Metsploit's reverse TCP module. Um, so yeah, it just downloads uh, next stage from a given C2 server. Um, it did have some kind of customizations, uh, likely to kind of avoid basic network signatures. So the download did first, uh, first downloaded four bytes, uh, then it downloaded 32 bytes that I just ignored. And then finally, the rest of the file. And the first four bytes is the length. So they just checked that. Um, they also had kind of a mining. And it's probably more a kind of integrity check. Um, but once you've decoded the payload, can you find a, the pop R15 or call, depending on your architecture, um, and call that? And that was pretty much it for the like, prolonged access stuff. So let's go into the juicy stuff instead. So the first wiper event in Ukraine last year um, was called Whispergate. It was something that like, was first identified by Microsoft. Um, and it uses a mixture of kind of commercially available tools. Um, they're called Pure Crypto. We internally call them Goose Chase and Fine Tide. Um, and it's gone up in price recently. So it was $49 last year. So inflation um, is affecting them right now. <laughs> but it also dropped uh, this MBR wiper called Paywipe and this kind of file encryptor slash random, uh, sorry, ransomware. Depends how you, uh, how you see stuff called Shady Look. Um, and this was the first of, of many kind of fake ransomware operations. And we'll discuss why I'm calling it fake in a second. Um, we also noticed, oh, sorry, Microsoft also noticed that this was kind of distributed around the networks within Packet. Um, that's a tool we often see GRU using. Um, 
And yeah, as I mentioned, it's a bit unique just because of that kind of commercial part. So let's discuss PayWipe. Um, so this is a very basic MBR wiper slash disk wiper. Um, the actors had some awesome OPSEC on a stage one .exe, um, very stealth. But all it did was open a handle to the hard drive and kind of overwrite the MBR. And when the victim rebooted the box, the MBR code will then go and wipe the 199th, uh, every 199th sector on the hard drive. Um, and it displayed this kind of fake ransomware note, like pay me 10,000 or you don't get your data back, which wouldn't have worked anyway because, um, she look. And it's loaded in memory by Goose Chase. Um, again, stage 2.exe, got to get that OPSEC in. Um, and all this did was overwrite the first megabyte of every single file we see, oh, of fly, files they care. So like a list of, um, they had a list of extensions, they enumerated them, any of those that matched, overwrite the first meg, and then rename the file with a random extension. Um, it's not that interesting. It's very basic. Like All this code at the bottom is pretty much like if you Google it, I think there's some, some random forums from like 10, 20 years ago discuss exactly this technique. Um, but what we did find pretty interesting was there's, there's, there was another family called Wary Look um, that came in from like 2021. Um, so yeah, it's, it's functionally similar to this shady look. Um, so yeah, exact same kind of file enumeration. Instead of a random extension, they put a hard-coded one. Um, it was quite smart. It encrypted it with AES, but never saved the key. So, you know, ransomware 101, keep the key. Um, and it also weirdly installed itself persistently on the device. Um, and literally, that, that persistence was there just to do one thing, and that was just to display a pop-up. Um, so every time you restarted the box, you had a little pop-up saying, hey, you've been owned. Pay me and you can get your data back. Um, so yeah, this was kind of the first, the first wave of wipers, and at the time we were a bit like, oh, it's a bit, a bit weird, but we'll, we'll keep looking. Um, I already explained that. Um, yeah, so then kind of move on. The next month, uh, the eve of the invasion, there was a huge kind of uh, like coordinated kind of attack against uh, Ukraine using wipers called Neomis and Party Ticket. Um, and these were associated or run along the same time as kind of some defacements, a group calling themselves Free Civilian. Um, and that Free Civilian group would do web defacements literally the, the, exactly the, day late, uh, the year later. Right, so these kind of fake um, groups that they send up trying to claim kind of glory. But um, this is a master boot record, uh, my, a master file table, and a file wiper. And this is quite kind of interesting. So with PayWipe, they had to write the, uh, according to the MBR to wipe the rest of the file system or the rest of the hard drive. Uh, Neomis got around this by using a public driver. So uh, EasyOS is some backup software. And they've got a driver that anyone can call. So in Neomis, uh, the GAU called that and basically um, just open a handle directly to the driver, which gave you a handle directly to the hard drive, um, and just started overwriting data. Um, this was a bit different to the previous ones, right? So this was written to create as much damage as quickly as possible. So it targeted the MBR first, then the master file table, um, and then tried, started wiping files. Um, and it also had like this shutdown timer. I think it defaulted to like 25 minutes. So if after 25 minutes you haven't deleted all the files, you just reboot the box. Um, which when you think about it, like day one or evening before the, the invasion, right? You've got all your networks that had this run just start popping off at different times. So everything just starts shutting down. Um, probably not a good day for you. Um, this also had some pretty cool techniques and that we kept seeing um, after this. So like, they would disable volume shadow copies, um, turn off crash dumps, just your basic stuff. Uh, just makes recovering this data a little bit harder. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, Neomis, um, this is not the best slide, but I do apologize. But like the top function is literally, you get given a list of regions or sectors of the hard drive that you need to wipe. Um, and they basically just enumerate that list and create a new thread that just does 
open the handle to that dr physical drive and just override it. So we also saw party tickets. So party tickets are uh, Golang, um, file encryptor, fake ransomware, however you want to see it. Um, it's got a lovely kind of web page that I make you look at once they've uh, destroyed all your files. Um, and it's kind of, it tries making a unique key for every file, so it sounds pretty interesting. Um, but CrowdStrike were the first to note that this kind of key generation was all flawed because they forgot to seed the run function. Um, so basically, you can recover every file. And CrowdStrike did awesome work. They shared a, um, a Python script um, like in the first couple of days after this um, for everyone to recover stuff. But we also found some interesting stuff with this. Um, and that was they accidentally deployed in at least one network. So obviously, very stressful being a GRU operator in a war. So you're, you're panicking. You have all your files listed there, and you pick the wrong one. Um, and probably hope that no one realizes, and there's no Windows for you when you get home. Um, but yeah, so they dropped the wrong one um, with the wrong command line arguments. Um, and they actually put the command line arguments for near missing. So that was kind of one of the first ones where we were like, you guys have messed up somewhere. Um, I also want to highlight, like, it looks and sounds like a ransomware payload. Um, but like the fact it's with near miss um, on the same device from the same operator probably indicates that even though they tried to make it like a ransomware, it was not. It was a disruptive tool all along. So next up, the literal following day. Um, so on the day of the invasion, um, Skyfall, also known as Acid Rain, um, was deployed in a network and started wiping out uh, some internet service provider, well, a internet service provider. Um, and this affected like Ukraine, but also neighboring regions in uh, Europe. Um, so the code's pretty simple again. It enumerates all the files um, and just starts writing over the content of the files, starting with minus one. Um, but what's pretty interesting here is like at least for 2022, this was the first time where a disruptive attack affected outside of Ukraine. Um, but if you remember like the history, 2016, NotPetya, also aimed at Ukraine, spread everywhere. So it kind of gives you a glimpse into the GRU's mindset, or at least Russian intelligence mindset, um, and whether is, is there a, geo, like is anyone considering the geopolitical risk of doing this stuff? Because like, you, you did a big boo boo, you messed up here again. Sims not Petya, Sims time and time before. Um, so it's kind of interesting to think um, about that. I'm going to move on to Cali Wiper. So um, it's one of my favorites. So this was used first um, in a financial sector um, before going um, and being used to target government um, computers. Um, and it literally turned into the go-to wiper for 2022. Um, so, you know, I said earlier, like, they, they wrote these tools to be used once or twice and then binned. This is kind of the exception to that rule. Um, and it had some pretty cool techniques. So, first off, it checked, is it on the primary domain controller? Because, as we'll discuss in a couple of slides, um, the, the way they were getting these to execute everywhere was just by group policy objects. Um, so yeah, you don't want to you don't want to break your group your primary domain controller before you've wiped everything else, right? Um, and then it just wiped kind of users files and then every drive starting from D all the way to Z if they're connected. Um, and then again, kind of like the innovation, they kept adding new features. So Caddy Wiper was the first that tried to take ownership of the files prior to wiping. So they probably learned the hard way. Oh, last time we couldn't delete all these files, so let's let's now take ownership. Um, and then we see this technique used again in tools like junk mail, which today we won't discuss because there's a lot of wipers. So, as I said, caddy wiper was kind of weird because it was supposed to be used probably once or twice, and then we see, you see it used all the time. Um, and the reason they can do that was this tool they call Aggie Patch, or we call Aggie Patch. Um, and for, for the invasion, second time, they tried using kind of an in-memory loader to kind of obfuscate or hide their wipers. Um, and that's pretty cool, because like makes it hard to detect, right? Um, but Aggie Patch is a bit interesting, because it's actually pretty similar to Freetoe. Uh, so one of the first tools we spoke about. 
in that it literally allocates some read-write memory, uh, reads a file in from somewhere, writes into that memory, decodes it using a pretty flawed XO algorithm, um, then does another virtual alloc, which I'll explain a bit more in a sec, to change that memory back to executable, and then call it. But like that, that virtual alloc to change protection is a bit weird, right? So um, usually you do use virtual protect in these instances. But what the threat actor was doing was allocating these memory regions with only mem commit and never mem commit and mem reserved, um, which Windows allows you to do. We also meant that they could then change the memory protection uh, permission without actually calling virtual alloc. Sorry, virtual protect. And virtual protect is usually kind of a pretty well hooked function. Even like ETW will will alert you if if you do a virtual uh, protect call with executable memory. Um, they do the same with virtual alloc, but one of the things with virtual alloc is you tend to expect that memory region to be empty. Like you've just allocated it. Why would you spend a lot of time looking at that memory region? It should be empty. Um, so yeah, that's pretty interesting because it actually shows that they probably had some nifty tools somewhere. Um, they were at least aware that antiviruses were probably going to hook their in-memory load in. So they did this to kind of get away from that. The other interesting thing is this EXO algorithm, which I think took me a while to actually realize what on earth they were trying to do. So they've taken a 16-character key um, and then enumerate the entire content and basically do 16 XOs with the key, each like one character of the key. Basically, 16 times slower doing a single byte XO. Um, and it's interesting, because when you actually look at these files, you can decode the first one with like B. I think it was hex B, decoded the entire file. So they had a 16 byte key that you decoded with a single character key, um, which makes zero sense. But also what's pretty interesting is um, going back into this, like their toolkit, they've gone into their old toolkit and said, okay, what? What crypto algorithms do we have that no one really knows much about? Um, and there's one in a, a loader that we call Dark Mirror, um, way back when. Um, and that had like a similar loop, but it actually worked better because they incremented values, right? It was a rolling key. Um, so my, my suspicions on this entire suspicions, but I like, I like guessing stuff, right? Is there was some tired GIU developer who was like, okay, how do I do XOs again? I know what, I wrote one 10 years ago, let's just go and grab that, and we'll just put it in here. Um, so yeah, pretty, pretty interesting. Um, there's also three major versions of Aggie Patch. So the first one we saw in April was pretty basic. It just read this file in from disk, decoded it, and run it, like what I just explained. Um, then like the literal following month, there's another two, and that one had a sleep timer. So they can coordinate the wipes so they can say, hey, at midday, I want to wipe all this network and start running the tool at like 9 a.m. Um, and then the third version, which was literally the same as the second version, but instead of having the sleep logic kind of in plain text, it was a shellcode. So they had an encrypted shellcode blob um, that had a key associated with it. Um, and what they basically did was enumerate those values in the blob um, and load first off the sleep timer and then once the sleep has finished, they just loaded Caddy Wiper and executed it. Cool, we're gonna move on to Presti or Prestige Malware, uh, ransomware. Oh, this was actual ransomware, so they did good. They actually wrote ransomware this time, not, not a really bad version of ransomware. Um, but we found this, uh, we, Microsoft originally found this, um, and it targeted the transport sector in Poland and Ukraine. Um, it was written like proper ransomware. It was crypto PP to load uh, a public key um, and then encrypts all the files. Um, again, it deletes all your like shadow copies and everything. Um, but again, like under the hood, they used like uh, impact it to distribute it. Microsoft attributed it to the GIU, uh, to a group they call Iridium um, or some of them. Um, and this is the second instance kind of that the GIU have started targeting outside of Ukraine again, right? Um, this one probably made a bit more sense than accidentally wiping stuff. This, this was a physical, like, they targeted people. They did not want this link back to them. Um, but it's a bit interesting how they just, yeah, again, just start wiping elsewhere. Cool. So I've spoken about all the tools. 
that they've used, but like, how did they actually get these tools to run? Um, and you think, oh, I, I hoped when I first started looking at this, it would be something cool, right? But no, it's just group policy objects. Um, so they have a script. It's basically a rehashed version of like Sharp GPO boost or Power GPO boost. But I think they wrote it all themselves. Um, and they even left some like lovely comments for us in the codes saying it's Sharp GPO boost. Um, but basically, all this does is, if, for those who aren't aware of like the Sharp GPO boost, um, it creates a group policy object to copy your file throughout the network. Um, and then after that, it creates a group policy object to execute your file as a scheduled task. Um, and that's all they were doing. They were just setting up these group policy objects, spreading it throughout the entire network, and kind of succeeding, right? So let's jump to, to our kind of conclusion here. All these campaigns were littered with kind of low equity um, and single use kind of tools, right? Apart from the or limited use, I should say, tools. Um, and I've really just, I know I said in the um, abstract I was going to do everything. Turns out there's a lot more that happened in the last year that I've forgotten for probably for my mental health. Um, so these are all the wiping events that we kind of, we've tracked up until May this year. Um, I think there's a couple more to add to this screenshot. Um, so like th there was a lot of a lot of things happened last year. Um, they also took a while. So like at the start, you may be able to see like they had like different wipers all the time, and then it was caddy wiper, caddy wiper, caddy wiper, caddy wiper. Like they just started repeating that. Um, and we think they kind of had this toolkit. They had this lovely toolkit right at the start, planned for three days of invasion because you know it's Russia. We can do that. Um, used everything panicked a bit, and then just started using variants, stealing more stuff from old tool, tools. Um, they keep trying to masquerade as ransomware actors. Um, most of the time, they're not that good. But like Presti, they, they could have gotten away for, with, with it. Right? There's only a couple of things that kind of led back to the GAU. Um, and stuff like Wary Look, or Shady Look, whichever one it was. Um, we never found where they use that. So th this is clearly something they try doing for years now. So this is clearly a, um, the, one of the ways that they operate. Um, they had a lot of success. There's no doubt in that. But there's also like st those stupid mistakes that probably, like as a nation state threat actor, you shouldn't be making. Like, don't drop the wrong files. Um, write a bit better. Right, there's a lot of stupid stuff that we probably wouldn't expect from threat acts like this. Um, and like, regardless of the variety they tried introducing different languages, um, like it all failed because everything was underpinned by the same techniques. Um, so yes, they, they introduced a lot of variety, but everything was cross-contaminated. Um, and they kind of left flags pointing to them. Um, and I think one of the... the for me, kind of the scary thought is they clearly don't care about geopolitical risk, right? They're, they're happy to do these wiping, um, wiping operations. They're happy to target outside Ukraine. What's going to happen in the future? Nobody knows. Cool. So I'm going to finish now just by saying, like, this was not all my work. Um, there was, like, hundreds of people at Mandiant who worked tirelessly for the first year. So a huge shout out to all these groups, um, and that's it. Any questions? <laughs> oh. Oh, oh, cheers. Uh, that's cool. So they started. Hi. So they started by not caring about the money, right? They just saw it wiping. But then later on, they decided that they wanted to try to get some money. So I think the the ransomware stuff was more to throw people off the scent. Oh, okay. So I don't. I, I, I hope no one paid them for these stuff. The, like a lot of the malware, the ransomware didn't even. Well, it wasn't recoverable. Um, so I don't think that was the objective to actually get money. I think it was just a, a disguise, like. 
Couldn't be us. That was a ransomware group, right? Thanks. Um, so the tools that you uh, displayed, they don't seem too sophisticated. Um, so do you think they're actually held back by lack of technical ability or is it a strategic choice to do it that way? So I think this is strategy. I think they know, like they've, they've done Indestroyer, which is quite a sophisticated thing years ago. They, they can do better stuff. But I think, it, I think this is all like a decision, right? You, they're writing lower equity, so they're not burning as much. Um, so it's probably all like, yeah, save, save a bit of cash rather than burning all your tools. Hello. Thank you for the talk. Very interesting. Uh, can you uh, explain to me how they could have better targeted their attacks? What like tech they could have done used for that? And um, can you expe explain Pokemon Master Team for me? <laughs> I knew that was going to come up. Um, I'll do the first one first. So um, I think I think they actually targeted well what they needed to. Um, I think like they could have used better lateral movement techniques. They could have. Operationally, they could have been cleaner. So they could have done stuff to make it harder to find them. Um, but I think they got all the targets they probably wanted. Um, and got a, like the, the, a lot of the disruptive activity worked, as expected. Mm -hmm. um, and on the second one, the Pokemon Masters. So that is uh, a group of, it, I think it started at the start of the invasion. Um, and it was just like a group of analysts, like Russian analysts who got together. And for some reason, that name was chosen. And it's stuck. So yeah, it was just, and now, now, don't tell Russia, but like a lot of our like internal work looking at them is, is some Pokemon nowadays. Okay. <laughs> just happened. Uh, one more question. Were these all like Windows attacks or was there any like, are, are these people all using Windows for like critical security? So all the, all the tools I spoke about were, but if I jump back, um, there was, there was a couple in here, so like the In Destroyer, Solo Shred, Awful Shred. Um, there's some stuff that was that was targeted on non-Windows. Um, a lot of the stuff we kind of, yeah, everything I reverse tended to be Windows. Um, but no, there's definitely cross-platform stuff. Hi, Hi. so um, I was just wondering, you've been focusing a lot on the sort of disruptive smash and grab sort of things. Um, uh, we're seeing a lot of smash. Have they been doing? Have you been found finding any grab or data exfiltration or anything like that? Yeah, there's, there's definitely been that. Um, so some of the operations that were like they were in place for months before. Um, in those, we found them doing kind of data collection. There's other parts of um, like the the GIU doing other collect as well. But yeah, um, they 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 seem to. On my mind, they probably like collected all the intel they wanted prior to the invasion and just end it. Um, a lot of the kind of activist groups um, tend to do like hack and leak stuff. So they're, they're also doing a lot of that. Um, um, what kind of like uh, vectors were they using to like get into the environment like initially? Like were they doing like phishing or was, were they getting access through some other means? Uh, it was a bit of everything, I think. Um, some some of the stuff was probably started by phishing. There was others where they had prolonged access for at some like some considerable time before. Um, and I think um, no, like we weren't able to identify the initial access vector for everything. Awesome. Thank you very much, guys.